Good afternoon. We uh, resume the uh, lecture today again on uh, this series of lectures on uh, Six Sigma. The uh, theme that we are discussing presently are design of experiments. This is a process that is used many times when uh, theoretical knowledge is not sufficiently advanced. It is not advanced yet to the point when you can write down the equations that describe the behavior of the system. Just to kind of remind you where we are coming from, uh, recall this uh, picture that I showed you a long time back. Uh, it had uh, the, the theme again here was the quest of mankind for control of various systems around us. We have on one hand uh, systems such as the weather system or economy or psychology. These are systems where we cannot even list the causes that produce the effect. We can only observe the effect for most part. At the other extreme, we've got uh, the digital watch, for example, where theory has progressed to the point when we can write down the exact equations that basically describe the function of my digital watch. Here's an example. This, the theoretical knowledge has advanced to the point here where I can write down the exact equations that describe the behavior of this watch. In between, of course, are all these other systems. There is medicine, there is chemistry, there is physics, there is engineering and so on and so forth. Here, of course, we are certainly not at the stage when we can write all the equations, but we are trying to use experiments to move to the right, to slowly move to the right. There was a point, of course, when electronics was experimental. The theory got built much later as we picked up more and more better and better understanding of what was going on in the real system. So, we started at the left extreme, which is like a system like the weather or psychology or economy, when we could not even list the factors. We got to the point when we could at least list out the factors, we could draw the cause and effect diagram. And then we used techniques, various experimental techniques, empirical techniques to try to sort of develop knowledge that would then gradually move us toward equations that would help us design systems that have predictable behavior that we can predict. In today's context, of course, we are going to be discussing this technique called DOE, design of experiments. And in particular, I am going to be focusing today on the calculation procedures that are involved in DOE. When you conduct DOE, you collect data, you collect data in a controlled manner. Now, what do you do with the data? Our goal basically is to try to understand what are the effects, what are the different effects of the different factors that are impacting the system. That is like something we would like to know. We would also like to know is that effect significant when we compare that to noise and also if there is interaction between the effect of two factors, two or three factors that might be affecting this. So, basically an experiment is a test of a series or a series of tests and basically these are used widely in engineering and uh, you know natural sciences and also physical sciences. What we are really trying to do is we are trying to characterize the process and we are trying to achieve optimization of some sort. We might be evaluating material properties of things or we might be designing a new product for example or conducting some sort of developments. And in fact, it turns out that uh, all experiments, they are designed basically in such a way that uh, some experiments turn out to be well designed, whereas some others turn out to be poorly designed. The result is this, with some experiments you can calculate, you can go on further and you can convert the data into information that you are able to do with certain types of experiments. These are well designed experiments. There are other experiments, but this is not possible, that actually indicate some problem with the design of the experiment. That is the manner in which you have manipulated the system and you have collected some response data. Let us see how we do it. The theoretical and mechanistic models, these are empiric, these are models which are based on theory. Then of course, you have got empirical models. There are like I said before, there are some systems that we understand very well. We understand their functionings very well and we can write down their equations either from thermodynamics or electronic circuit, circuits or queuing equations and so on and so forth, we can describe the behavior of these systems in an exact theoretical manner that we are able to do. Then there are other systems which are really complicated and uh, these uh, also involve a lot of noise. And uh, for such systems to for us to understand how they behave, we have to conduct experiments and the kind of experiments we would like to conduct and these experiments are going to be the most effective ones are the ones that are planned by DOE design of experiments. So, in fact, if you are trying to approach data gathering or knowledge acquisition 
through experiments, the best way to go there is to use the DOE path. What are some of the examples? There are some examples where you can use theoretical models. For example, project scheduling constrained by resources. You can construct a mathematical programming model for it. This is something we could probably do. When we are looking at uh, the RSSI system, this is a system that helps us locate the uh, determine the location of vehicles. This is also possible with a theoretical model. Many times process optimization can be done by applying calculus or other search methods. There again a theoretical model is available and you can actually go ahead and do it. And of course, uh, in all these areas, science has advanced to the point, science and engineering both have advanced to the point when we can write down the basic equations that describe the behavior of the system. This of course is not possible with all systems. An example is uh, engineering systems. Many engineering systems are such we can perhaps list the controllable factors and we find there are a lot of uncontrollable factors that cannot really enter our equations. Then there are some inputs that the user or the, uh, the driver or the, or the other or the basically the person interested in letting the proce process operate or perform, he provides some inputs and then of course we observe the output. These are, these are typically what most engineering system comprise. What of course we have to do is we have to see how this particular system behaves. Without really having that understanding, we would not be able to control the output of the system. And the system by itself would just be standing alone and we won't really have much use of it. What we would like to be able to do is we would like to be able to set up an experimental setup where we control the inputs in a manner where we understand what factors are, what treatment levels are, these are the settings at which these different factors are set. Then of course, which factors are fixed and which factors are going to be randomly fluctuating when the experiment is conducted. Then of course, the output is what we are interested in. So there could be something that we call the response variables. We'd also like to see as the output of the total empirical study process, interaction between factor effect. This is something we'd also like to be able to understand and also would like to definitely understand the effect of the main factors the prime actors in the uh, process, the, the different main factors such as temperature, pressure, concentration. These are the factors that vary in the system and the, <coughs> these are the ones that require some sort of adjustment in order for us to optimize the system and get the performance come in a manner, come out in a manner that is optimal for us. There are certain principles we apply when we use DOE. For example, replication is a process that is used whenever we are replicating the same trial again and again several times. This is because no matter what system you are looking at, like the system that I showed you, there are some factors which are controllable, but there are many factors that are uncontrollable. Now the ones that are uncontrollable, those I am not setting and therefore I do not know when they are on or when they are off or to what degree they have changed during the experiment and so on. That is really not known because these factors are uncontrollable and many are actually unknown. In a situation like this, the output is going to be noisy. What we would like to be able to do is, we would like to fix the settings of the control factors at a certain design setting and then we would like to repeat the same trial several times so that the on the average, the effect of the uncontrollable factors would get neutralized by the averaging effect. This is something that we would like to be able to do. So that is why we use replication. We also sometimes use this uh, principle called randomization, which is like, let us say you are running an experiment, you are running a chemical process and this experiment is being conducted in a, at, in a, in a situation, in an environment where the uh, environment and temperature changes from morning to lunch time to evening and so on. Now in the morning, of course, temperatures are cool, so you may run the experiments. You may run experiments in the morning and if you are not controlling the temperature externally, then of course the experiment is going to be subjected to this morning ambient temperature which is going to be cool. Then around 2 o'clock which is like about just past lunch time perhaps, temperature heats up and the weather gets warm and so on and so forth. If you run your trials at that point, perhaps the response would be different because now the external environment which is the uncontrolled factor has changed from being cool to warm. Then in the evening of course again temperature is cooled down. And again, if you run some experiments at lunch time when temperature, temperatures, ambient temperature is warm and then you run it again in the evening, there would be a difference. If, if you are trying to experiment 
if you're trying to run your experiments in these three settings, for example, there should not be an order. There should not be this. This sort of thing should be randomized. So if you've got experimental trials, you should randomize their conduct, the, the time of their conducting between morning, lunchtime, and evening. And one should not really have, for example, certain experiments run only in the morning, and certain and process settings change, but those experiments are run only at two o'clock. Then again, you run the same trials with some other settings of the process of the process factors in the evening. If we do this, there will be some effect of the environment also. But if the environmental, environmental sequencing, if it is randomized, then of course the effect of uh, such external factor is going to be then more or less neutralized. So this is like this is the idea of randomizing. Then there are certain other principles also utilized in conducting experiments. These are called blocking. And blocking is a way when there may be a factor that might be impacting your process. But you are interested in neutralizing that effect. So you, you in fact, you construct blocks. And this was actually, this procedure was invented when uh, Ronald Fisher was trying basically to uh, try to come up with uh, schemes or methods or identify the effect of various, various factors such as fertilizer, water, sunshine, soil condition and so on and seed quality on yield from farms. There he used blocks because he could not really take the same piece of land and run all these different trials and different sequences. He did that by dividing up the total land into blocks and then he randomized the allocation of the experimental treatments, those he randomized over this. So this is called blocking. Blocking basically does away with, the, with the, any effect that might be there because of that other factor which is not part of my experiment but it is something that could also impact my, uh, my, my outcome of the experiment. That is why blocking is there. <clears throat> now let us take a look at different types of uh, setups that we could utilize in experiments. Now I, as, I, as I mentioned to you, experiments are done by controlling certain factors which are which we call the experimental factors and these are also the control factors. We change their settings at will. Uh, we, we follow a certain scheme in changing the settings of these factors. So there are going to be obviously many different factors and if you do a little cause and effect diagram, you will find that uh, you know the main stem of the, of the fish bone that goes the horizontally. Then you have got some factors that are affecting this fish bone basically coming and these are going to be the design factors. These are the ones that you will be manipulating. Then there are a whole lot of other factors which are like random factors or noise factors or nuisance factors. These are also going to be impacting your, your experiment. So basically the total process would be under the control of part your design variables and part these noise variables. They are both, they are both, both of these sets they are going to be impacting on this thing. So this is something you got to remember. When we design an experiment, when I design the scheme or the plan to conduct experiments, you got to be mindful of the fact that the design variables we are going to control and the basically the noise factors nature is going to control. And what we have to do is we have to somehow neutralize the effect of noise or have a data analysis scheme that can still help me get get basically reliable results by looking at the output in a special way so that I neutralize the effect of the noise variable. This is something that will be done when we do get into this uh, phase of uh, data analysis. Now design factors, they may be allowed to vary randomly or they may be held constant or they may be allowed to vary according to some plans, that also is possible. So either these may vary randomly or they may vary according to a particular matrix or they may be held constant. That is our choice, that is basically the experimental plan. Noise factors may be controllable or may be uncontrollable, but all of these they are called basically noise factors. And they are the ones, they are factors, of course they are impacting the system, but we are not terribly interested in looking at the effect of noise, that we are not interested in. Rather would like to find out whatever the effect is of the design factors, so that we can optimize the process. This is, this is what we would like to be able to do. So what are we talking about? When we talk about design factors, we talk of treatments and levels. Treatments are for example, they are the different settings at which, at which I could conduct the experiment. There is some process factor which is going to be varying and I will be able to vary them. This process factor, for example, if it is temperature, I could set temperature at 10 degrees Celsius, 20 degrees Celsius, 30 degrees Celsius, 40 degrees Celsius. So there are four treatments now. 
10, 20, 30, 40, 4 settings possible for temperature. For pressure, I could have two settings. I could have uh, 10 psi and 20 psi. Those are going to be my two settings. So, I have got two treatment levels for pressure and I have got four, four treatment levels for temperature. When I conduct the experiment, of course, I combine the two. In the full factorial situation, I will be combining every pair. I will be basically running the experiments under every pair possible with a pressure setting and a temperature setting. This is what I will be doing. So, it will be 2 times 4. That would be the number of experiments that I will be running. There will be like 8 trials. But there are of course, this is a full factorial design. There are other designs which do not require you to run all 8 experiments. And of course, they do not also produce the same amount of information. The full factorial experiment will always produce the maximum amount of information. Not only about the main factor, but also about the interaction between the factors, factor effect. The partial factorial design, when you choose not to run 8 trials, but perhaps only 4 trials, these are special designs, uh, special matrices that you that you use to guide your experiment. And these, these matrices are such, they require fewer trials, but they are clearly not as revealing as the uh, full factorial experiments. We will see that in a couple of minutes. And of course, when the factors are discussed, when experimental factors are discussed, there are situations when I can fix the settings of these different factors, the factor levels at certain fixed levels. These are going to be fixed factor experiments. Then of course, it is also possible that I run my experiment by letting the experimental factor vary randomly and we'll look at the impact. These settings are chosen randomly in the random, randomly chosen experimental experiments, factor, factor guidance. And if the factor levels are randomly selected from a population, the effect is also going to be variable and the data analysis methods are going to be different from the one where I have got fixed levels. In the fixed level case, I am going to be showing you both of these. In fact, I will be focusing mostly on the fixed level experiments because most practical experiments, they are of the fixed nature, fixed treatment level type. But there are situations when we might use randomly set selected uh, uh, settings of these uh, different process factors that also we could do. Now, what about the response variable? The response variable is something that you measure and it is quite possible you would probably measure more than one response variable because you are running the experiment. If you can observe multiple things coming out of the same trials, go ahead and do it because it will reveal more out of the experiments. As far as effects are concerned, as far as factor effects on those uh, responses are concerned, there are two types in which we have a lot of interest. The first is the main effect and these are the effect of the individual factors such as pressure, temperature, concentration and so on. Then of course, there are other effects which are called interaction effect. These are perhaps the interaction between pressure, between the effect of pressure and also the effect of temperature. Perhaps there is some interaction between the two. And this is what brings in complexity when you look at the response. When you look at the total response of a process, many times the total response is the composite effect of main effects which could be as many main factors that you have, as many experimental factors you have, then some complex interaction contributions also that might be there. We will do some calculations, we will try to see for the particular system chosen, are main effects present there and what is their extent and are, are interaction effects present there and what is their extent. We will we'll see that as we get into it. So, the basic principles just to recap again. We have the idea of randomizing, which is like running trials in an experiment in a random order, so that the factors that you are not controlling, they are not able to affect the, uh, the, exp the experiments, the trials in any systematic way. And of course, we many times we would also like to help, uh, like to utilize the effect of the, the help of random numbers. This is probably used, this is used quite often to try to uh, basically sequence the trials that you got. So, you may run the first trial first, then you might write the sixth trial, then you write the fourth trial, then you write the third trial and so on. You are randomizing the sequence, you would be running your trials. This is being done primarily like I said before, in order to neutralize the effect of any factor that you are not controlling, but you want to fool nature. Replication is something that we also would be interested in when we are conducting experiment and basically the more you replicate, the truer you are going to be to, to close it to the true, true response because you are looking at then with, with replications, you end up finding the average response. 
that should be looking at. Then, of course, there is, the, there is the effect of blocking, which is to try to isolate controllable noise factors. And if you're able to block them, then you neutralize basically the effect of the, these uh, nuisance factors, and you're able to basically basically cancel out their effect of each other on on the real process itself. That also is is quite possible. <coughs> what sort of strategies people use? The design of experiments method, of course, is the most uh, sophisticated method, statistically ex designed experiments. Then, of course, there are best guess, ex best guess experiments. I'll give you some examples of this. Then there are experiments that are like one factor at a time. And, of course, the best experiments are these statistically designed multi-factor experiments. Let's try to take a look at what these are. The factorial experiment, and I'm going to be giving, giving an example. And this example comes from the game of golf. And uh, when you're playing golf, your score, of course, the idea is to try to keep your score low. Hit the ball as few times as possible to complete all the 18 holes. Complete walking through the full course and you complete uh, sinking your ball in uh, each of the 18 holes. The fewest number of sh fewest number of strikes that you make in doing so, that becomes your score. And the, and the, and the person who is able to do this in the shortest number of trials, he becomes the winner in a golf game. What are some of the variables? What are the different factors that might be affecting your uh, score? The tribe of the driver, you know, the driver is that hockey like stick. stick. It's got uh, that uh, head there at the end, then you've got this long stick there, and you bash the ball, you, you bang the ball, or you put it, or do whatever. You're doing that with the help of this uh, driver. Various types of drivers are available, and these are heavy, they are round, they are, they've got draw space. They've got composites and all kinds of things are there. Then, of course, the length of the bar that can also change. There are various types of drivers available and they have different names also. So, even if you're looking at only the driver, the real, the real uh, stick that you use to hit the ball straight off the tee to get your first shot. The first shot is usually a very long shot. I'd like to get a driver that actually hits accurately and also hits fast and far. This is what I'd like to be able to do. So, there may be some choices there. There may be a special driver or there may be a regular driver. So, there are two, type, two type, types of possibilities. Let's say we are trying to optimize the choice of driver, the type of ball we are going to be using. Are we going to be walking around when we play the game of golf? Are we going to be riding a cart? What kind of beverage will we be drinking when we uh, basically have uh, you know, the need to uh, drink something? We could either be drinking beer or we could be drinking water, or perhaps we could drink nothing, that also is possible. The time of round, which could be morning, afternoon, evening, whenever it is, what is the weather like, that might also affect your uh, score. And the kind of spike you are using, and so on and so forth. There are many different factors that can impact your total score, total golf score. Let's say we are conducting an experiment, and we are going to be doing a very simple experiment. And we are saying, we are saying we've got a choice of two drivers, two types of drivers. One is the ordinary driver and the other is the special driver. So, I will I am just going to be calling them type O driver and type R driver. These are the two types of drivers we have, two types of sticks we have to bash the ball. As far as the ball is concerned, there is the regular ball and this is called the balata, balata Italian ball or there is the uh, T type ball. This is a special ball which is uh, marketed by some particular uh, Supermarket, supermarkets. So we've got two types of balls also that are available. So what are the two choices? <coughs> I have two, I uh, basically two drivers with which I can play, with which I can hit, and of course I've got two types of balls that I can use in my play. So two times two, there are four possibilities. There are four possibilities. You see then that this becomes this actually gives me two times two or four different ways in which I could really play this game. And those are shown here. If you look at the matrix here, these are these two four, these these two by two, and therefore these four possibilities. The first one is going to be type O ball, the type type O drive driver, and type B ball. So this is O type driver and B type ball, and this one is the R type driver, and again B type ball. This is like another possibility. Then of course O type driver and T type ball. And of course, this one is the last one, last combination possible, which is like T-type ball and R-type driver. So I've got 
OB and I've got RB, I've got OT and I've got RT. These are the four different ways I could play this game. And uh, borrowing, you know, so something that we mentioned earlier, we should not just play one round of game with these four different combinations. We should play multiple trials because there may be these other factors that I'm not including in my game. So let's actually do this. Let's play multiple, multiple replicates of the same game. So we'll play the game, play the same game multiple number of times. Let's say we play it perhaps if we have enough money, four times each. So we'll be playing the BO combination four times, we'll be playing the BR combination four times, we'll be playing the TO combination four times, we'll be playing the TR combination four times. After that, of course, we gather some data and we record the data. And from this, we're going to be working out the effect of the driver, the main effect of the driver. This is something we're going to be working out. So we'll find out if going from O to R, if this reduces our score, it could reduce or it could increase. We don't know that yet. And of course, also when it comes to uh, changing the ball type in using ball type B versus ball type T, what happens to the main effect of it? I mean, do I do I score? Do I do I end up with a smaller number when I pay, play with ball type T as opposed to playing with ball type B? That's also something we'd like to find out. What we now do is we'll take a look at the results of this uh, game. Let's say I've done that. And in this case, of course, I show you two trials only. I show you the effect of two trials. So look at the top. This is where, then look at the top diagram there. This is where I've recorded my uh, two rounds. Basically, I said earlier that we'll be playing four rounds at each setting. Let's say I, I did not have enough money. So I, I, was, I had enough money to be able to play four rounds once and then four rounds again. This is all I was able to play. I've recorded my scores here. So for, and I'm going to be writing them down. So I have here, for example, I have uh, for the BO combination, for the BO combination, BO combination, my scores are going to be 88 and 90. For the BR combination, my scores are 93 and 91. And for the TO combination, my scores are 88 and 91. And for my basically TR combination, my scores are going to be 92 and 94. These are, this is the data that I calculated data that I recorded. Now, of course, I have to do my calculation because I have to find the effect of, for example, you know, type B ball, type T ball. I have to find the effect of using the O driver as opposed to using the R driver. We have to find that. Basically, what we would like to know is, we would just like to know, is there an effect due to change, my, my changing the driver with which I hit the ball? Is there, an, is there an impact on my score if I change the driver from the O type driver, from being the O type driver to an R type driver? This is something, this is one of the things I would like to find out. The other thing I would also like to find out is when I use ball type B versus ball type T, is there an impact on my average score? This is like something I would like to be able to work out. I've already got my experimental data which is shown here. This, this is the experiment data that I've gathered. I've run the two experiments and I've done it in a way when I've randomized the trials. So perhaps my randomized trial was, if I just put down the sequence here, perhaps I paid this one first, then I paid this one, then I played 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 this one. and I'm left with uh, this one. That, that's what I played the last. As far as 1, 2, 3, 4 are concerned, I have randomized them. So hopefully the effect of all the other factors is going to be averaged out because of my randomized. Now what we'd like to be able to do is we'd like to find the effect of uh, going from uh, type O driver to type R driver. Let's see how we find that out. 
what we have to do is I again go back to the picture here and I show you what I do is I take an average I take an average here first of all I have to find the average of 88 and 90 that is something that will be the average score there I do the same averaging here I do the same averaging here I do the same averaging here this of course is not going to be terribly difficult this is going to be 89 this is going to be 92 this is going to be 93 and this is going to be basically 89.5 those are going to be my averages so let me write down my averages and my averages are going to be I'm just going to put down the averages here average score is going to be here it's going to be 89 so it's going to be 92 so it's going to be 89.5 and it's going to be 93. These are the averages. The utility of these averages is that this has neutralized then the effect of the factors that I did not control when I was playing my game. I put all of those as factors that were other than the driver and the ball. This is what I did. From this, of course, we are supposed to find the effect of the uh, changing balls or changing the driver. Let us see how we do that. What I do is I find the average of two quantities and those two quantities are going to be the following. I average out these two and I average out these two. Let us try to do that and let us try to do that precisely. I will be using a calculator. So, I will just put that here and I have got uh, essentially 88 plus 90 divided by 2 that is 89 that is already there. So, that is confirmed. Now, let me average out this one these two I have 89 plus 92 divided by 2 that is 90.5. So, that that number is going to be 90.5. So, I have 90.5 And uh, what is common between these two? B. B is common. So this is going to be the effect of B. I'm going to be I'm going to be telling you a little bit more about this in a couple of minutes. Let's also average out these two quantities. I've got 89.5, 89.5 plus 93 divided by 2. That's 91.25. And uh, when I'm doing this, what is common between these two is T. Now remember, my uh, column here. This column was for balls. And this column here was for driver. And what I've done here is I've found really the average effect of playing with ball type B and the average score of playing with ball type T. So I could quite easily at this point produce a plot. And what would that plot be like? I could just draw the plot here. I'd first draw the axis. And I'd start at 95, and then I'll have, uh, or let's make it 85 because it's quite low, 90, 95. And let's let's put on this side the two ball types, and those are going to be my B and T. B and T. What do I see now? I see the score of B to be 90.5 that is what here somewhere uh, score of T is going to be 91.25 that is going to be somewhere here. If I join them there is a slight rise as you can see there is a slight rise from 90 to 91.25 
that slight rise is too is because of the change that I made in going from ball type B to ball type 2. This is the this is the effect. In fact, if you look at the uh, the number carefully, you'll find this delta. This delta. This delta is due to ball change. That is the effect of basically changing your ball. Let's do the same calculation using the driver. So for that, what we have to do is we have to average something different. Let's see what we average. We write down, we write down here the average of uh, type O first. So that's going to be, I put down here uh, the average of O type first. So that's going to be 89 plus 89.5. And I'll work out the average of it. That's going to be 89.25. So I can directly write here the effect of uh, O type driver is 89.25. O type drive. Just like I have B type ball giving me 90.5. For O type driver, I end up with a score of 89.25 on the average. Let's look at the other one. And the other one is going to be R type driver. And that's going to be the basically the average of 92 and 93. That's going to be 92.5. That's going to be the effect of the R type driver. So here again, the change that took place when I change my driver from O to R is going to be an increase in score. And this I can again write, I, I can plot it again, like I did my plotting before. I can plot like this. I'll have some quantities there. Start with 85, 90, 95, 95. This always is this side, the y axis is always my golf score. So it's going to be a score here. Score is going to be on this side. And what do I plot on this side? Let's try that. Let's try to write that. I have 89.25. That's going to be, let's first put down what, what is it that we are plotting? We'll plot uh, type A. Type uh, O is here. And type R is here. And these are what? These are driver types. I have O type driver and R type driver. For O the score, for O the score is 89.25. That's the average score. That's somewhere here. And for R, the average score is 92.5. That's going to be somewhere up here. If I join them, that shows me an increase. And again, as we did before, Let's show this effect. This is also a main effect. This is also a delta that is due to driver. This, this, this change is due to the driver changing from O to R. This is the change in score. This is the change in score. So both this, this is the main effect. I can just write it main. This is also a main effect. Main effect always is the Main effect always is the effect of a single factor, main here and main here. So I've got a main effect calculated there and a main effect calculated there. Now what about interaction? Interaction becomes a little, little more complicated to evaluate. And for that, what we do is we'd average out two quantities. We'd average out 88, 90, 92, 94, which is like 89 and 93. If you average these two out, I can actually get an interaction factor. I will say the, uh, and I'm just going to be plotting that directly. So let me just get my scale here first. I'm going to be plotting this time the interaction between the two. So I'm going to be uh, my scale here, interaction low and high, and I'll just call it interaction. And this interaction is going to be now between ball and driver. Low and high. And let's see how you calculate that out. 
and of course my scale is marked at 85, 90, 95. That's my score. Let's try to see if we could get my interaction plots done. I'll just make sure the reading is okay. I have uh, the low level is going to be the middle point. So that's going to be the average of 92 and 89.5. And that's going to be very close to if you really look at it, I could I could just use the calculator to do that. 92 plus 89.5 divided by 2. That's 90.75. 90.75 is the low level. That's about here somewhere. And let's do the other one. That's like the average between 89 and 93. That's actually 91. So I'm going to be putting that right about here. 91. <coughs> Notice here, it looks like there's almost no interaction. This is the interaction one. So let's see, at least give it a title. This is interaction. What have we done? Let's try to summarize what we've done. We ran some experiments and our experiments were run using in this particular case different types of balls, two different types of balls and two different types of drivers. We ran those trials and we ended up the data here. Where is the data? Let's try to put that uh, within a red sort of zone. My experimental data are right here. That's where my data is. This is my experimental data. And if I just shift the thing a little bit, you'll be able to see I wrote data there. When I have my data there, the only thing I have to do is I have to remember under what settings I obtained those things. What are these two numbers? These are two replicates of experiments run. That is like my game, game played under the same settings. I was using ball type B and driver type O. And I played two rounds and the average turned out to be 89. I ran this other trial. This is like the other game I played, played, another game I played, ball type B, driver type R, and the average turned out to be 92. Then I used ball type T and driver type O, and the, uh, the result turned out to be 89.5. And of course, ball type T and driver type R gave me an average of 93. Once I have these, because the particular structure of this matrix here, I'm able to find my main effects, the two main effects. One is of course for, uh, this is going to be for ball type and this is going to be for the driver. So I've got the effect of the ball and the effect of the driver. Both I've got pulled out of the same data. And of course, not just this, I've also got the interaction found out. So in fact, it turns out this system has very little interaction very little interaction. This is close to zero. That means there is no interaction between these two. That means if I was trying to lower, if I was trying to reduce my golf score, I could manipulate this variable independent of what I do with this variable. I could, I could bring this setting to B and I could bring this setting to O. So if I were to minimize my trials, if I had to minimize my trials, I'd be best off playing with a ball that is of type B and that's uh, and, and using the uh, club type that is going to be your uh, O. In fact, you do see that the scores are the lowest here. The average scores are the lowest for this. So this also verifies what we just concluded by looking at the graph. This method of doing your calculations is quite straightforward and it can be done if you follow a particular matrix structure and that matrix structure is shown here. In fact, I show the same matrix structure if you look at the uh, diagram. Let's come back to the diagram here again. Here's the diagram. I have a two by two situation and I would be run, running like if you assume this to be minus and this to be plus and this setting to be minus and this setting to be plus. I have minus minus at this setting. Minus for this, minus for this variable. Two variables, 
minus minus. This one is going to be plus minus plus minus is here. Here it is going to be minus plus, and this this setting is going to be plus plus. So I've drawn basically a matrix which has got minus 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 plus plus minus and plus plus. This is a matrix structure. This is a matrix discipline basically, and this is called the full factorial plan. When I'm using two factors at two levels each, if you cross them, you end up with four combinations, and that's exactly what we covered in doing this thing. Now this is okay. This approach is okay if the noise variables don't have too much of an effect. Will you say noise had no effect? What do you think? Well, look at these numbers. Look at these numbers. If the other factors, which I'm now ignoring, if the other factors no effect, I would have had 89 right here throughout. If noise had no effect, I would have a 92 throughout. If I, if the if the other variables had no effect, I would have had 89.5 in both of these trials, and I would have had 93 at both of these trials. But that has not happened. So the variation that you see here is really due to noise. This is something very important for us to realize that actually noise has disturbed the system. And many times this noise is so high that we are not able to draw these diagrams. Because in place of just one value, you will end up with a variation there like this, a variation 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 like this. And when you have got background variation that is varying like between this number and this number, or this number and this number, then to be able to tell the difference, whether there is a statistical difference between this number and this number, I have to do ANOVA. I have to do analysis of variance. That is like a special mathematical technique which we will be discussing shortly. We will begin it in this session, I will complete it in the next session. That is something we will be doing if the background noise is too high. Now we could ignore that because these variations, these variations here, they are not too big. They are not too big, so we got away by doing this. This is something we got to remember. Let us see what we produce. We will proceed next. It is possible that you do not have enough money to be able to play all 4 plus 4 plus 4, 8 rounds. It is very possible that you would like to probably cover another factor if possible, but you do not have enough money to be able to do that. No, I had, I had 4 plus 4, 8 rounds run here. Suppose I had the same money available. Could I somehow, could I somehow study another factor? Now what happens if we just bring in another factor? Suppose you just bring in another factor, what happens? Suppose I wanted to now experiment with three factors. We actually wanted to, while we were playing the game, we wanted to vary three experimental variables. One would be the driver, the other would be the ball type I use. The third would be the beverage that I drink. If I was just doing this, if I had three variables, I will end up with eight different possibilities. I will be changing driver this way, I will be changing ball this way, I will be changing my drink this way. And I end up with eight different possibilities, eight different combinations. So instead of the previous one, which had only four trials, now I end up with eight trials. But the advantage is now I can study not only the main effect of three variables, that is ball type, driver type and the drink I use when I am playing golf, but also their interactions. Those also I can figure out if I run these eight trials. So it is an advantage. This is actually a factorial design. In fact, if you can keep adding like this. If you are willing to conduct more trials, if you are willing to conduct more matrix type experiments, you can get a lot of information. You can get information about the main effects, and also you can get effect on the of the of the interaction effects. So both types of both types of effects you can figure out if you are willing to run the full factorial experiment. Now suppose I had if I had a fourth factor, and that factor was going to be the mode of travel I use when I uh, play my golf. For example, I wanted to play my golf, not just by walking around because it's a lot of distance. Probably three four kilometers I have to walk perhaps even more in some golf courses, on some golf courses. So what I would like to then do is, I would perhaps like to use that cart, 
there's the electric cord that takes me from you know hole A to hole 1 to hole 2 to hole 3 to hole 4 and so forth. This is where they have these little flags there and you basically drive from point A to point B to point C and so on. You basically write this cord. That way you could probably save some energy, you could probably pay more rounds, you could probably do it quicker also. All those things are possible if instead of walking you are using this cart. Now that might give you some rest also, right? So the expectation is if I want to raise my performance, which is like if I want to lower my golf scores, perhaps I should ride in a cart. How do I find out if that has any effect? Well, I could run. Now I already have eight trials. I could run eight trials while I am walking and I could run the same eight trials or similar eight trials when I am riding a cart. So now I have got eight plus eight, 16 experiments and of course 16 are not going to be enough. I will also have to replicate all this because there are these noise factors that I have ignored. So I will have to probably now run 16 times 2 maybe 32 rounds of golf. That is not going to be all done in one day by the way. You may have to come back on different days. And then of course, uh, you will have to also think about randomizing the sequence in, in which you play your golf, golf game. Unless you do that, there is going to be a messy situation. This is something where we would like to make sure that you use a proper matrix. Use a proper matrix to plan your trials. You use the sequencing correctly so that you know the effect of these random factors, they do not begin to bias your trials. You do not like uh, play your games when you are fresh, some of the games when you are fresh and some of the other ones. Like for example, if you if you are looking at this matrix, you should not play all the uh, you know all four games here, four or eight games if you replicate in the morning and then all these four games in the evening. If you do that, then the effect of drinks is also going to be what we call, basically it is going to be confounded with the effect of temperature variation from morning to evening. So, you would like to run some of the experiments, some of those you know you got the 8 points there, some of those you might like to play randomly in the morning and some of those play, some of the you might like to play in the evening. If we do that, then of course, you will end up with a completely randomized full factorial trial and you come out there, your your effect of noise is going to be low and you could really work out the, these calculations without too much trouble at all. Now, suppose you did not have enough money and you still wanted to do this, you will have to give up something. You still wanted to find the effect of balls, you wanted to find the effect of drivers, you wanted to find the effect of drinks, drinks, and also you want to find the effect of riding a cart, for example. But if you did not have enough money, so you could not really run, in this case, 8 plus 8, 16 trials, you could not do. In that case, you could actually run what we call partial factorial design. So instead of running the full factorial design, you could run partial factorial design. And here is an example I show on the screen here. Three variables are here. So, I have got balls, I have got uh, driver types and I have got uh, beverage. Those three are here and then across on this other side, I have got here I am walking and here I am riding a cart. But notice here, I do not run all the all the eight experiments. I selectively run this corner, this corner, this corner and this corner. Uh, for this one, I run the other four corners, that corner, this corner, this corner, this corner. In doing so, I have really cut down my total number of experiments from 16 to 8. So, this is not a full factorial design, this is called a fractional factorial design or a partial factorial design. This can again lead to the calculation of the main effects. So, the main effect that we saw here, I could do this experiment, I could do these calculations using a what we call a fractional factorial design, I could do this one also using a factorial factorial design, but I am sorry we could not do this experiment. We could not do these calculations using a fractional factorial design. So, what we have to remember is we have to know the objectives, we have to know the objectives of doing the experimental work. If we do that of course, then we got no real problem there and uh, for more complicated situation, something that I will be discussing in the next session is to try to utilize the technique of ANOVA which can be done when the background is pretty noisy and just mere replication is not enough for you to complete your study. I will continue with the uh, discussion of ANOVA in the next session. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.